Hey, what's up, guys? How you doing? Hope everyone's having a great week so far, and uh, you're ready for a great weekend of fights, man. We've got uh, a great one tonight and an even better one tomorrow, although we might have uh, tomorrow's fight might be in jeopardy, so I'll talk more about that in just a second. Uh, we're going to do a little something different for this show, guys. Um, normally on the Friday wrap-up, I have phones up, and you guys will call in and we'll chat. Uh, today, we're going to have Tom Loeffler on the show, so no phones. He's going to come on, and we're going to talk about a whole bunch of stuff. So you guys are going to have a lot of fun with this, man. We're just waiting for Tom to get on. He's crazy busy, of course, because tomorrow uh, Chocolatito's fighting in San Diego. And, of course, Tom uh, works with Chocolatito. So, you know, is your, if you're a promoter during fight week, you're running around like crazy. And that fight, who knows what's going to happen right now. Let me share my screen. Um, right here is a story that uh, Doug Fisher posted from San Diego, he's down there on the scene. Julio Cesar Martinez misses weight. And uh, he missed weight by two pounds, I think, his first time on the scale. Weighed in at 117, of course, is a 115 fight. And uh, he came back later <clears throat> later on. I think he was given two hours. I think that's the California rule. Let's read here on Doug's piece. Uh, this was at 9 o'clock uh, a.m. this morning, the weigh-ins. The weigh-ins for this card were odd. But um, he waited again about an hour and a half later, and he only lost a fraction of a pound. Still came in 1.4 pounds over. So um, basically, here's the situation right now. The California State Athletic Commission is going to allow this fight to happen, but Martinez cannot weigh more than 15% more than the division limit, right? So he can weigh in. He's supposed to weigh in no more than 10% more. If he does weigh in 10 to 15% more, he will be fined again. He's already going to be fined. He's going to be fined 20% of his purse. But if he comes in more than 15% over, so if he rehydrates too much, then the fight's off. That's it. So this fight is still in jeopardy. We don't know. We won't know 100% until tomorrow. Uh, for Martinez, this is extremely unprofessional. And it's a massive red flag for a guy that has been caught with banned substances before. Um, he's had issues making weight before. So this dude has a history. And remember, he's a 112 fighter. This was gonna this fight was gonna give him a break. He was supposed to come in at 115, right? So uh, all, all of us thought, okay, he should make weight this time. But he he weighed in basically as a bantam weight. And it's not as if this was just a simple miscalculation. Maybe his scale was off because, again, he came in two pounds over, and then an hour and a half later was still more than a pound and a half over. So he barely lost anything, uh, which shows that he really wasn't trying that hard uh, to, to lose the weight. Uh, even Chocolatito said that. Even Chocolatito said right here – or actually, I'm sorry, it was his trainer, Marcos Caballero, said uh, he, Martinez, had two hours to lose the weight, and all he did was hit mitts. He didn't run and he didn't use the full two hours. That tells me he wants an advantage. He still has water in his body. So who knows, man? Who knows if that fight comes off? But um, again, extremely unprofessional behavior from Julio Cesar Martinez. And um, that's just, that sucks, man. That's a huge buzzkill if this fight doesn't happen because of his actions. And um, if, if the fight does happen, and he looks huge and strong and ends up scoring this uh, a win in any way, even if it's just a unanimous decision, but especially if it's a knockout, there's going to be a huge asterisk next to this win. So it really is just a buzzkill. Um, I'm still looking forward to the fight. I, I hope that Martinez doesn't rehydrate too much, comes in less than 10% over, and we have a good fight tomorrow night. And um, at this point, I think everyone's going to be rooting for Chocolatito. I mean, how could you not? So that's what's up with that, man. Um, let's get to the chat here. I want to see a couple of you guys in the chat here. Make sure you hit that thumbs up button, by the way. Go ahead and hit that thumbs up, man. <clears throat> All right. Uh, a few of you guys excited for Tom Loeffler to get on. Yeah, he should be on in like five more minutes. And um, you know, I've talked to Tom a couple times in the in the last week or so. And um, we've been talking about what's going on in the Ukraine. And of course, Tom Loeffler worked very closely with the Klitschko brothers for years, especially Vladimir, you know, helped promote him. 
and uh, make him a, both of them a brand here, but especially Vlad, uh, particularly Vlad. And he's close with those guys and is close to, uh, he talks to them a lot and talks to people around their camp, you know, around their team a lot and stays in contact with them. And um, you see, he's plugged in to what's going on over there. So we'll talk to him about that. But another thing Tom wanted to hit on was the Andre Ward stuff. Andre Ward and Gennady Golovkin had this back and forth on Twitter last week. And by the way, just, just for full disclosure, because I saw some people tweeting about this, and Tom, I, we can ask Tom directly, but Tom's already told me, I already know. That, that account is not some person running it for Gennady. I, that's like the rumor on, on Twitter is that Tom Loeffler runs the account. Tom Loeffler runs Gennady Golovkin's Twitter account, and there's other rumors like that. It's not. Gennady says things in Russian. It's translated and posted on, on Twitter. So that, that's how that works. <clears throat> um, I saw a comment here. Yes, uh, Nacho says, uh, Mike, Jake Donovan reported that if he weighs in at 126.5, the fight will happen, but anything over that's canceled. Yeah, uh, Nacho, that's that's that 15% threshold like I was telling you about. Uh, so it's it's 15% from the contracted weight, which was 115. So uh, 10% of that is 11.5. I'm not even going to do the math right here, but you guys get it, right? Uh, it's It's got to be within a 15% threshold. If it's more than that, fight is off. So uh, that sucks, man. Uh, by the way, uh, oh, Jack on the, on the chat says, phones today after Tom. No, Jack, no phones because uh, this convo with Tom could go a minute. Um, I'm hoping that he gets on here soon. So we can uh, start talking about stuff. But yeah, because um, I want to hit a, a few different subjects with him. Of course, we're going to talk about the fight tomorrow with Chocolatito. But then we got Golovkin Murata, which obviously Loeffler is heavily involved in. I want to talk about that deal a little bit and just how big of an event that is over there. Because a lot of people just, I, I think, underappreciate how big of a star Murata is over there. And then we can even talk some Golovkin Canelo. If that comes off, uh, we could talk about a whole bunch of stuff. So as soon as we get him on, we will uh, we will talk about all that. And um, all right, you know what? Actually, I think Tom is on here. Let me uh, let me bring him in, guys. And by the way, uh, no phones today. So if you have a question, get it in on Super Chat or whatever. I might not see it otherwise. Um, and and we'll go from there. Okay. Thanks a lot. All right, Mr. Loeffler, how are you doing, sir? Michael, I'm good. I haven't uh, spoken to you for quite a while. Yeah, man, it's it's been a while. It's good to hear your voice and uh, see your face. I'm digging that that's that uh, sweatshirt right there. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, Doug Fisher Ring Magazine. Yeah. yeah. All right, man. Let's let's we got a bunch of stuff to talk about. Um, let's let's jump right into the situation in the Ukraine with the Klitschko brothers. Um, just here, just my camera a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah, it's uh, boy, it's uh, it's crazy. No one thought, you know, no one expected, I guess, except for uh, Vitaly, who was uh, really crying out for help the whole time, uh, yeah. just asking for uh, weapons to uh, help defend themselves. But uh, in one week's time, the world has really seemed to turn upside down on its head. Now nobody's talking about coronavirus anymore. Everyone's yeah, talking about. Everyone's I miss, I miss about, coronavirus already, man. I miss COVID. Yeah, everyone's talking about Putin and uh, and the invasion of Ukraine. It's it's horrible. I, I I see some of these videos over there, and I posted them on social media, and it's just it's horrendous what's going on over there. Targeting residential buildings, right? Uh, blowing up civilians. It's uh, it's it's unimaginable that we would see this again, especially with the history that uh, Europe has gone through the whole time. Right. That we would see this. Uh, that we would see this again. I, I, when's the last time you talked to either Vlad or Vitaly? Have you talked to either of them recently? Yeah, I, I, I'm normally in uh, regular contact, uh, more so with Vlad, only because Vitaly's so busy with his, uh, you know, running the city of Kiev and being the mayor. Um, but uh, the last time I, I texted with Vlad was uh, a week ago, Thursday. Um, you know, I was texting with him pretty much every day before that, just saying, how does it look now? And, you know, as, mm -hmm. as uh, the, the troops were coming in or crossing the border. And then at that time, he just said, the last text I got from him just said, we're ready. So, uh, you know, if anyone can survive this and be successful, it's, 
definitely Vitaly and Vladimir. Um, mm -hmm. You know, two of the biggest fighting hearts that I've known. Uh, Vitaly, especially in the ring, was never afraid of anyone. Uh, he told me a story one time, you know, when I said, you know, when we were talking about the Lennox Lewis fight or whoever it was, and, you know, that was on short notice, if you remember, and he said, Tom, I'm not afraid of anyone in the ring. If it's just one person, it doesn't matter to me. I used to have to fight like 20 people when he was growing up on the military bases and, uh, you know, people would surround him and he'd have to, as he was a young boy growing up, uh, he'd have to pretty much uh, defend himself that way. So, uh, you know, natural born fighters. And, mm -hmm. um, uh, and then you see all the other champions, whether it's Usyk or Lomachenko, even Sergey Bohachuk. I was going to ask you about Bohachuk because I saw he, he just went over there, right? Yeah, it, well, no, he was there. Uh, okay, he was okay. supposed to come over. He was supposed to come over and start training with Manny Robles in Los Angeles for a fight uh, March 25th in Canada. And when all this happened, he stayed there. And uh, he's not in the military per se. His older brother is, but he's... He's uh, definitely setting up barricades and uh, helping the city, helping every, everyone organize, just kind of bracing, bracing for this uh, attack. And uh, again, it's just uh, this whole country is under siege. Um, yeah, I saw a video today w with literal charred, burnt, dead bodies, uh, like, like a dozen of them. It's horrendous. Uh, horrendous. And then they targeted the uh, nuclear power yeah. plant which uh, again you go back in history uh, we all know the history of chernobyl especially with the klitschko's being uh involved with that their father was sent right. there for the cleanup and uh he suffered because of that he suffered he had uh, cancer after that and uh that's ultimately what he passed away from but uh for that to actually you know come around again and and uh, putin targeting i'm not even going to say the russian army it's, it's all putin you know, the Russian people, I've heard so many stories where the Russian people are protesting and getting arrested, but the Russian people don't want this war. They're they've dead, down, dead against it. They've shut down all news media, all social media uh, reporting about this war because really th th these are uh, human atrocities. This is cr crimes, of, crimes against uh, humanity and uh, war crimes. So uh, I don't know how they're going to stop Putin. You know, unfortunately... Um, unfortunately, all the sanctions that the U.S. was talking about is like a day late and a dollar short. You know? Yeah, that's sanctions. that's putting it very nicely, Tom. I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be politically correct. That's but, being uh, very friendly to uh, the people in charge right now. It's yes, very infuriating, especially like I said, Zelensky, the tally, all everyone was saying, "Look, we need what we don't even." We just want defensive. We just want to be able to defend ourselves. Just give us in the tank in the case tanks come, just give us weapons to uh, to defend ourselves against tanks or airplanes. You know the Stinger uh, missiles against airplanes, and uh, they wouldn't do it. And 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 not only the U.S. but even more so disappointing yeah. was Europe. Yeah. Uh, in Germany, uh, I have German heritage, and I'm embarrassed that uh, they would build a pipeline to rely on Russia for like 50%, 60% of their oil and gas. It just it made no sense, especially with their history. And uh, finally, last Saturday, after also denying weapons, uh, finally Saturday, they agreed to send weapons, but then how are you gonna get them now? Now Kiev is surrounded. How are you gonna get logistically the weapons into the country, into the city? That was pretty where, strategy. They needed them two weeks yeah. ago. <laughs> You know, yeah, I mean, America is, as far as I know, is still, I think it's over 100,000 barrels a day we're, we're importing from Russia, I think still, unless that's changed in the last week. But I know just a few days ago, it was over 100,000 barrels a day. So it, it, a lot of it's mind boggling. I wanted well, to ask you, oh, I'm well, sorry, go ahead. Just, just to touch on that, when you talk about sanctions, okay, you're going to sanction Putin and the oligarchs and, you know, the ruble is collapsing, stock market is collapsing, which is affecting the regular people. Not right. uh, Putin. Putin right. saved that. Putin planned this way ahead of time. When he had all those troops massed on the border, when he had the blood banks, that's really what seemed to give it away. When you're transporting blood to the border, you don't have blood just for military exercises. You know you're going to go in there. And uh, like I said, it seemed to be clear to everyone in Ukraine, but not to our leaders or the European leaders. And and to touch on that, importing Russian oil, whether it's Europe or the United States, is you're basically funding that war machine 
uh, that's going into uh, Ukraine right now. So whatever the sanctions are, you're actually counteracting, counterbalancing the sanctions by by it's, funding the military budget. It's all political theater. Um, there's midterm elections coming up here. I don't want to get too political, but you know how the game is played. And it's just, it amazes me how people fall for this. But I wanted to ask you, because one thing a lot of a lot of my followers on Twitter have been asking me, how involved are the Klitschko brothers? Are, are, are they involved equally or differently? Are they back in an office somewhere doing strategic type of work? Or are they on the front lines with rifles shooting? Or all of it? <laughs> I think it. Uh, I'd have to say it, it changes on a daily basis. I, I don't mm -hmm. think they're. Uh, you know, there's pictures of Vitaly with uh, with a machine gun and and uh, you know uh, just uh, you know familiarizing himself or target practice, whatever it was. But uh, that could ch change at any given any given moment. I know Zelensky, the president, has to run the country. Vitaly has to run the city. But, uh, you know, you've heard about those Chechnyan uh, hit squads that yeah, are there. And, and, and that's and, legit. That's not a rumor. That's a real thing. That's a real thing. And, and the, the president is supposed to be number one. And I'm sure Vitaly, as the mayor, is right up there. And Vladimir, uh, you know, both high-profile uh, figures are right, right on the there list. On hit list. So it's just it's one of those uh, uh, <clears throat> horrifying things that, um, you know, I, I'm here halfway across the world. Here's two of you know my closest friends that I've worked with, you know, so long promoting uh, their fights uh, ever since 2003 uh, when he fought Lennox Lewis, 2004 when he fought Corey Sanders, and then all of Vladimir's fights and that uh, huge championship run that he went on with Emmanuel Stewart. Uh, and now to think that you know your world can be turned upside down. We're here. Uh, you know, Southern California, the sun shining, whatever, and you can't really, I can't enjoy the day when I know in the back of my head, it's like, you know, the horrors that uh, these guys in this country is going through, and not just them, but like the women and children they're targeting, they, they hit yes. orphanages. When we had the WBC convention in uh, in mm -hmm. Kiev, you know, the WBC Cares, they, they did an outreach to... Uh, uh, one of the orphanages there in Ukraine and uh, hospitals are, are being hit. It just uh, it's unimaginable what they're what they're going through and uh, to have not assisted them or aided them more uh, prior to all this happening. And look, if, if Putin didn't go in, then you can take the sanctions off. But sanctions take literally about a month to to kind of take take effect and. Uh, it's just it's it's unfortunate what they're what they're going through. Yeah, I think a lot of Americans um, don't realize how certain steps, missteps taken or, or or lack of steps taken by our leadership helped bring us here. You know, um, that's that's the most frustrating part for me because, like you, I, I know you know I've gotten to know a lot of fighters from that part of the world. I mean, you can't work in boxing and not know people from that part of the world. And uh, there's guys that I've trained with, worked with, and talked to on a regular basis that are involved in this. I keep I keep it off the record. You know, I don't talk about a lot of the stuff on the record. But um, this, I'm not going to say it could have been prevented 100%, but the impact of this absolutely could have been could squashed. Have been right. Yeah. You yeah. just need to give them a fighting chance. Yeah. You know, they never asked for troops. They never asked for, look, there's 35 million people in, in in Ukraine. They never asked for European or NATO or American troops uh, to come into the country. They just needed the weapons to be able to defend themselves. And uh, that that's the that's the disappointing part of, uh, of all this. But, uh, you know, hopefully, that, you know, that, I mean, they've been fighting valiantly um, with what they have. Uh, mm -hmm. Even though they're naturally outgunned by uh, probably the second uh, or third strongest army, however you put China in there, uh, and uh, here's Ukraine just fighting for their lives, uh, mm -hmm. just to defend their their country and their freedom and what they believe in. It. It's almost like they got abandoned because they wanted. They showed. You know, Vitaly became mayor in. He ran for mayor in 2014 because because uh, he knew the corruption that was there in the city and the country, and he was trying to clean it up. And him and Vladimir living in Germany and in the United States for as long as they did 
really wanted to uh, westernize uh, right. uh, the uh, the European country and culture, and uh, it looked like you know Europe was embracing them, the United States was embracing them, and then all of a sudden when Putin showed up, it's like oh we can't do anything. <laughs> it's like yeah. they got they got abandoned trying to become westernized. And I know there's the whole thing about okay, if you if we had done this or that, then you know Putin was threatening nuclear war and all that type of thing. But uh, Vitaly said from the beginning, he's like, Putin's not going to stop in Ukraine. If he comes through Ukraine, then he's going to keep going. And Poland's right there. Poland's, Poland's right there. there. All Rose. those Baltic uh, yeah. countries are right there. And uh, uh, you know, for having a fighting people like Ukraine taking Putin on is much better than. And giving them a chance much better than if you're, if he goes into Poland or one of those other countries around there. And now all of a sudden, you really do have, you know, now you're really shooting at at each other. And um, again, I just uh, hope and pray. And you know, anything I can do. Boa Chuck now, I'm going to put it on social media. Boa Chuck has a direct account that goes uh, from Citibank here. His account that he can take money out over there, and okay. he's he's not keeping it. For, he's distributing it, buying supplies for the city trying to help um they said there's like different uh, like glasses that uh, for the uh, riflemen mm -hmm. or uh you know uh, scopes whatever it is mm -hmm. that he can buy and the sandbags and you know they're putting up those tank things tank barriers so and then vladimir had posted uh vladimir had posted uh some other uh, accounts that go to uh, kia to help uh, defend the city so anything we can do financially to help them but it, it's really it comes down to you know, this might only, they might only be able to ha hold out seeing what happened. I mean, they're in Kharkiv, they're like flattening the whole city. It, it's yeah. it's literally like coming back to carpet bombing. And uh, I think Putin got frustrated with the resolve. Yes. Because a lot the, of people didn't think it last this long. Of right? the Ukrainian people. Yeah. And now he's just, okay, let's just start. Now they're just putting more missiles and more missiles. And how are you going to defend residential buildings against missiles and the nuclear power plant? or that oil refinery that blew up, you know, at some point they're just going to choke out uh, these cities or surround the cities. And I'm uh, uh, just, uh, like I said, hoping and praying that they have a fighting chance over there. Same here. And um, any links that you have, please share them with me. I'll, I'll okay. blast them out there and anything okay. that we can do. Um, I, I'll talk about it on my show Monday too, on my podcast, and we'll try to get those links out um, just to see, because I know folks want to help and people, yeah like you said, it's, it's on the other side of the world, you know, it, it's disconnected. And I think the American media is only going to be involved for so long and they'll find the next topic to talk about. So this could be going on for a while and anything that we could do to help over here, um, is, is huge as it relates to boxing. Um, you mentioned Sergei Bohacek had a fight in, in Canada. Now that's going to likely be pushed back. It's it's likely that uh, the rematch between Usyk and Joshua, Lomachenko is going to fight Cambosos in, in Australia. That's going to get pushed back. Um, how long do you think th these Ukrainian fighters could be out of the ring? Because it's not just the conflict. It's after that, you have to rebuild and everything else. And that's why they don't want to leave their families. Um, yeah. I heard, uh, I don't know, I don't have personal knowledge, but I heard uh, even uh, Postal after his fight on Saturday. Uh, that night. Over there. Yeah, that and, night. Uh, uh, yeah, it's one thing whether they take the cities and then you have this resistance uh, in the countrysides or whatever it is, or if they're able to hold them back and uh, the fighting continues. Putin's kind of back in the corner. It's like he can't retreat because then he'll be embarrassed in front of the Russian people, in front of the world. And yet he's got like, it's almost like everyone has turned against him now. The, the one thing that Putin has done besides curing coronavirus, because yeah. <laughs> it seems like Dr. Fauci couldn't do it. Yeah. I don't know how many years. By the way, but, he disappeared. He's he, but, uh, he was not but, there at the State of the Union. I, neither were the masks, by the way. I, I'm just putting that out there. Putin in one week cured the coronavirus. Yeah. Nobody's talking about it anymore. Yeah. I'm not trying to minimize coronavirus, but literally nobody's talking about it anymore. All the headlines are uh, this war in uh, in Ukraine. So it's just, um, it, it's it's the way the whole world changed in, in, in less than one week. Uh, I was in a, 
wedding, uh, a close friend of mine in Puerto Vallarta, and uh, uh, Muhammad Ali's wife was there, his attorney was there, and uh, a lot of other close friends, Omar uh, Miller was there, and, and uh, a lot of other celebrities, and, and uh, you know, going from that to coming back here, and then it's like the world just totally is turned upside down. It's hard to, uh, even going, I'm going to go to the Chocotito fight tomorrow in San Diego, the show that Eddie's putting on down there. And, uh, you know, all those type of things would normally you'd be like, oh, this is great. Let's go watch the fights. And mm -hmm. it, the, there's, a, there's like everything is downplayed because, you know, everything that they're going through yeah. over there. And again, these are people that you've known and worked with and yeah. developed strong relationships with. These are friends and you know what they're going through. Um, yeah. And they're it, just it's, trying to be, they're just trying to be a democratic country. They're just right. trying to be a free democratic country that they can make their own decisions um and and really contribute to you know better than what they were and that's why they're fighting so hard because a lot of the people most of the people remember how it was you know the klitschko's grew up under the soviet system right. their father was in the in the soviet military um and they knew what it was uh, to grow up uh, in that type of a system and that's why they're fighting so hard those people don't want to go back to that system yeah. Not just them, but the, the rest of the Ukrainian people, they, they've, you know, I've been to Kiev, I've been to Donetsk. Uh, there was a WBA convention in Donetsk, and it was a beautiful, this was a long time ago, beautiful soccer stadium, brand new soccer stadium. The whole city seemed to be rebuilt and vibrant. And uh, then that was the first step. That was 2014 when, uh, when Putin went in there. Um, and that whole city then got pretty much everything changed over there and a lot of people fled and they moved to Kiev. I had some friends there and they moved to Kiev and now it's like people have to leave Kiev and go to Lviv, which is further West and, uh, you know, close to the Polish border. Right. But the right. whole, the whole country changed in, in literally, uh, you know, first 2014 now literally in a week, everything's changed. It's, it's amazing. I, I, I want to try to transition to other topics I, I, we could talk about this for hours yes. um but you mentioned chocolatito yeah he's fighting tomorrow um obviously you're aware that martinez missed weight um yeah. are, you, are you plugged in with that situation what's the latest on that i heard about that i haven't uh, heard uh what the resolution was on that okay so so apparently they're gonna he missed it again uh, the second attempt, mm. and they're going to let him come in, but he can't be over a certain. I think he can't be over ten well, percent. Over they pay, I hope they pay Chocolatito a ton of money uh, for that. Apparently, twenty percent. Uh, that, yeah. That's what they're taking. Well, that's that's in, in those divisions. You know, a pound or two, or however much he missed it by, uh, makes a big difference. And literally going from one twelve as flyweight to one fifteen as super flyweight, it's a whole different division. Three mm -hmm. pounds. So I don't know how much did he did he miss it by? Do you know? Missed it by two pounds up front, and then an hour and a half later, uh, one point six pounds. So he only shed like a few ounces, that's which tells even, me he didn't even try. Yeah, he didn't try. Yeah, he didn't try. That, that's calculated. But is it wasn't Martinez coming up from flyweight yeah. anyway from one twelve? Yeah. yeah. And then to miss the miss the the weight that that. And it's not the first time he's pulled a stunt like this. He's had performance enhancing drug, you know, issues uh, in the past. So. Uh, yeah. Uh, just really, really unprofessional. I just hope the fight still comes off. Um, so hopefully he doesn't rehydrate too much. But I wanted to ask with, with Chocolatito, um, when do you get a sense that he's thinking about retiring? I, I mean, where does does he still want that third Estrada fight now that that blew up? Um, and has he talked about any of that? You know, I don't want to speak for Chocolatito. I have a very close relationship with him, naturally with Mr. Honda of uh, Carlos Carlos uh, Blandon. Uh, his longtime manager um, had the honor of putting him on numerous fights. I think it's seven shows total that we did. Uh, I think it was four Triple G shows, which was great, Michael. You remember those days when uh, it was, it was, man, that was a fun time. It was like Triple G and Chocolatito were considered one and two, however people rated them. Well, it was the big drama show and the little time. drama show. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, to have the top two pound for pound fighters in the world fighting on the same shows on a regular basis. Um, you know, Triple G was famous for selling out, sold out the forum. Uh, I think it was two times he sold out the forum. He sold Madison Square Garden two times with David Lemieux and, and Danny Jacobs. 
Uh, and we did a record at StubHub where they, you guys had to put in like, benches, I think. Yeah, not only did he break the record, he shattered the record. It, it, it held 7,000 people on a full, completely full day, and, and we had over 9,000 people there because of bleachers. Was that Rubio? The Rubio that fight? Was, uh, Marco Antonio Rubio. Oh, that man, was, that was a special night, man. The atmosphere that night, I'll never forget it. That, that was, was the amazing. first time he fought here in Los Angeles. I didn't know yeah. how the reception would be. And so we priced the tickets pretty low. We even had some $25 tickets uh, there just to, you know, make sure fans could get in in the upper levels. And uh, those things, uh, uh, one of the ticket brokers just kept buying and buying and buying more tickets, like from the box office, not even trying to, to uh, contact us directly. He just kept buying tickets. And uh, he knew the secondary market was so hot that uh, people were paying two, three times what the uh, mm -hmm. face value is. Uh, and then naturally for the floor, much higher than that, but that was a true, not only a sellout, but like I said, we, we broke, we shattered the record there. And there were so, so many great fighters there that have fought there. Uh, and this was the triple G's first time, uh, at, you know, at that on, on the West coast in LA, he, he had trained here with Abel Sanchez and Big Bear, but he never fought here. You know, it was, it was one of my strategies is to bring him up in New York at Madison square garden, because that's really the media capital of the world, everything that happened in New York was on a, on a huge stage. And uh, so we built them up there, but then to come to the West Coast and sell out uh, that many tickets uh, on his, in his first first fight here really was a, a special night, as, uh, as you said. Yeah, it was just, uh, you know, pr predominantly Mexican-American crowd, because obviously LA is, is over 50% Mexican-American. Yeah. And Triple G was fighting a Mexican fighter and the crowd was cheering for Triple G, you know, uh, th this half Russian, quarter Kazakh, quarter <laughs> Korean guy, you know, uh, yeah. it was, it was just uh, and that in the, the, the super fly cards yeah. were so much fun because they almost had a soccer game kind of feel because they were so international. Uh, that's, that's where, uh, if you remember, Boxing Guru had made those shirts. People thought this was like all contrived. Oh, yeah, like that's that. right. Yeah, that's this right. Was, this was ground roots, natural, uh, authentic uh, um, support from the fans. Uh, he, he had printed those shirts, uh, Mexicans for Golovkin. Yes. And uh, they were the hottest item on the night. He sold out. He sold yeah. out of those things in the parking yeah. lot, man. He broke the merchandise records. I saw that you put that tweet, which was 100% true, and someone tried to criticize, well, the – Oh yeah, we should get into this or whatever doesn't affect it, but it's all it's all linked together. If you have yeah. strong ticket sales, that means you have strong merchandise sales, which means is an indicator for either pay per view sales or TV ratings, and that's all linked together. And we broke the merchandise record for StubHub. We broke the merchandise record for boxing events at the Forum. We broke the merchandise record for boxing events uh, at Madison Square Garden, and okay. also with the two Canelo fights. We uh, broke uh, those merchandise records, um, and naturally, two times uh, over one million pay-per-view buys uh, with those fights. Uh, controversial fights. Uh, mm -hmm. Many people always tell me that they think uh, Triple G won both fights. Um, you know, I, I, when people ask me, I'd say, you know, first fight for sure. HBO had it eight to four. Um, mm -hmm didn't seem to be a question in my mind. And then the second fight, I, I thought Triple G won 7-5, but it could have been 6-6, uh, six, six, and then he would have kept his titles. But uh, the second fight, they figured out a way to, to take those titles from Yeah, since uh, we segue to Triple G, and you know, you mentioned merchandise and ticket sales and all that. Uh, real quick, Sam A in the Super Chat. Thank you so much, Sam. He says, if this were a real fight, Martinez would have to make weight. This is a fake WBC diamond title. I didn't even know it was a title fight, to be honest. I don't even look at it like that, the, the Chocolate Tito fight. But uh. I don't uh, – yeah, going back to that, I don't I, I don't know. I don't have a great feeling. I don't know all the particulars. I don't know rehydration clause, everything like that. But if Martinez had problems before uh, testing positive and if he's overweight now and we don't know what he's been eating or taking or drinking or whatever it is, uh, it doesn't – it doesn't bode well, unfortunately, because Chuck Petito is such a great guy and such a great champion mm -hmm. and uh, one of the uh, best uh, and most dedicated people that I know. And, and to go back just a little bit of history with Chuck Petito, I think that's how we segue into Triple G. But Chuck Petito was a huge – I don't want to minimize him being on those shows at all. He brought a huge oh, yeah. fan base with him. 
Uh, he's become a rock star in uh, uh, in Nicaragua. Um, you know, following the footsteps of Alexis Aguero, right. and uh, you know, he sold a lot of tickets when we had the David Lemieux fight, when we had the uh, Danny Jacobs fight. There were Nicaraguan flags all over Madison Square Garden, as long yeah. as well as Kazakh flags. And when we did those Superfly shows, it was like United Nations. It was like one those were, fighter, yeah. each fighter from a different country. And then yeah. it was like exactly like you said. It was like a soccer atmosphere where everyone was waving flags and cheering. And those were real boxing fans. It wasn't like comp tickets, the VIP tickets from some casino. Uh, people bought those tickets and uh, came to see their favorite fighter fight. And uh, uh, there's so many Mexican fans that supported Triple G. A big part of that, I, I have to give credit to Abel Sanchez, who did a, a tremendous mm -hmm. amount of interviews in Spanish. But uh, the Mexican fans respected. Gennady for his character, his personality, uh, his entertainment value, which a lot of fighters don't get yes. because if you're not entertaining in the ring, just like if you go to a movie and it's a boring movie, you, you're not going to buy a ticket to go see it again. But if you see an entertaining fight and people came to, to, to look for knockouts for the Triple G fights, then you know, uh, I mean, that's why... That's why they. Um, that's why they kept coming to to watch him fight. They knew it was going to be an exciting fight, and nobody, nobody was disappointed. It only went two rounds. It was like a Tyson fight. It only went two rounds with Rubio, and nobody complained about it because yeah. it was such a great atmosphere. And if you remember, we had that ring walk all the way around. I, I also yeah. took pride in uh, designing the ring walks or suggesting. I mean, Triple G always did what he wanted to do, but I would make suggestions. And he thought oh, that's a good idea. So it was the first time ever that a fighter walked all the way around StubHub, kind of acknowledging and thanking the crowd for coming out to support him. And it was a, it was a huge atmosphere. You see the overhead shots that the venue did specifically for that event because they knew it would be so full. And, uh, and, and it, it, uh, yeah, it really was an amazing night. Yeah, so with Triple G, we could talk about the fight with Murata in a minute, but I, I want to talk about the little spat he had last week with Andre Ward. I want to set some things straight because you saw me going back and forth with some yeah. of these guys on Twitter and these narratives, I don't know where they come from. I, I, I maybe some of these crazy YouTube channels or something, but they almost become facts in these people's minds. So well, the thing is you say it often enough and it's become and it fact. Seems like, I don't know why. Again, I, I think Andre in his own right had a great career. He's a gold medalist, Olympic gold medalist for the USA, which you always got to root for. Uh, he was a tremendous commentator, but uh, I don't know why he keeps going back to Triple G turn down the offer, which goes to me because I was the one that responded to turn down the offer. It was it started out as we turn it down in thirty minutes, and now it's been shortened to we turn it down in five minutes. Right? Yeah, that's, yeah, five minutes. That's the only reason I got involved because if he would have said the whole thing started for those people that didn't uh, see that whole. Uh, issue. It all started with um, someone asking a legitimate question. What are the fights that you wish you could have had in your career? It's Dan said, Raphael, right? We, I think he doesn't mind if we put it. Dan Raphael was still at ESPN at that time. I think you were texting with him or so you correct me if I'm wrong. Well, that's, a, that's a different one. No, I'm, I'm, talking oh, okay. about, I'm talking about now where somebody oh, the asked one. Him on, on his okay. birthday, uh, uh, what, uh, what fights do you wish you would have had? And he said, oh, that's Joshua. Right. Okay, that's great, Anthony Joshua, heavyweight. That, that's a that's a, a great fight to uh, have wanted. And Carl Froch at Wembley Stadium, which actually Triple G wanted the Carl Froch at Wembley Stadium. That was much more realistic because Triple G has the reputation of going around just like he's fighting Murata in in uh, Tokyo mm. or in Japan. Uh, he fought in Monaco three times. He fought Kell Brook at the O2 in London, and right. and uh, Andre never fought outside the country. So right. that could have also had another. Uh, another effect on why he, he didn't reach that same level. But then he said, then at Triple G, but Triple G turned down the offer in five minutes. And I don't know why he continues to insist on that. And that's the only reason that I, because I normally, I, you know me, Michael, I don't, to me, I don't get involved with fighters or distributing things, or whatever. But when he talks about turning down an offer in five minutes, that goes directly to me. And that's where I had to jump in and say, look, Andre, I have respect for you and your career. And I think he, I, I legitimately think he's a great commentator on ESPN. He has a lot yeah. of insight. He comes across well. I think he's much more entertaining as a commentator yes. than as a, as a fighter. I just never really, it just wasn't my cup of tea as far as his style in the ring. But, you know, for whatever that's worth. Uh, but he, he, he was effective. He, he got a lot of decisions. And, and 
uh, Hall of Fame, uh, first ballot Hall of Fame. But then he kept bringing that up, and and I don't know. It just, you know, we don't have to dwell on that. It uh, it just befuddles me whenever I hear it come back up. And like you said, it's like some of his fans are so ingrained to think like, yeah, they really turned down that offer. They did. They were afraid to fight Triple G. And I tried to clarify to everyone, he made the offer. Not him, Rock Nation. Let me clarify that. Rock Nation. Yeah, let's set a timeline. So, so this is late 2015. Okay. Yeah. When you end up fighting Lemieux in New York, now you guys had already signed that fight, announced it, had everything lined up. Then yeah, Rock it Nation. Like, it was. Ber I remember Bernie. I was in Europe, and Bernie had set up. It was over an hour's worth of interviews. That I had done because Triple G was so hot that that time. And Bernie Bermasel for for people the PR Bernie, PR Bernie guy. Yeah, it was the first time after trying so hard with Sergio Martinez, with Felix Storm, with whoever other champions. Uh, Peter Quillen wanted nothing to do with uh, Triple G when he was a WBO champion. None of those guys wanted to fight Triple G. So finally, we got David Lemieux to agree uh, in a world championship unification fight. We announced it. Headlines all over the world articles over the world and then maybe like two hours three hours after we announce it and i'm doing all these interviews i get this offer from rock nation would you fight andre uh, we, we want you to fight andre ward uh at 168 is a 50 50 fight i'm like thinking <laughs> we just uh, we just announced the fight is at madison square garden it's on pay-per-view he he holds the record still for that david lemieux fight as the fastest selling pre-sale for Madison Square Garden, it was completely sold out. Lemieux brought his own fans from Canada. Mm -hmm. Like I said, Chocotito was on the co-feature. Lemieux brought Canadian pay-per-view money, so it was it became a really big pay-per-view, and that was Triple G's first pay-per-view fight. So I told David, it was David Eskovitz from Rock Nation, made the offer. I said, David, we just announced the Lemieux fight. He's fighting Lemieux, and he's guaranteed the winner of Cotto and Canelo. There was no they they had right. gotten a few that fight happened a month later. I think it was because I was at that fight and it was in Vegas. I think MGM Grand. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Uh, no, that was at uh, Mandalay Bay, I believe. Oh yeah, yeah, um, okay, that's right. Because and that I was remember, the one. I remember uh, Rock yeah. Nation. The, the people of Rock Nation had these huge disagreements with uh, the Canelo people, and then the WBC Mauricio had to get involved and and all that type of thing. But anyway, uh, he was guaranteed the winner, which was a huge. That that that's literally at that time was the biggest fight in boxing. Right. So that's exactly what I wrote in my answer. I said, Dave, you know, we got this Lemieux fight coming up. I think it was October. And I think Cotto Canal was December. I think it was two months apart. Okay. But either way, I said, then he's the guy guaranteed the winner of Cotto Canal. I said, then if he, if he wins that fight, he wants to unify at 160. And then, you know, we could always talk about going up to 168 and fighting Andre. And it wouldn't have been at 50 50 because by that time, Triple G was a much bigger star than Andre. But, it, you know, it we could have considered it. And then, uh, HBO actually told me that uh, they had sent that offer because Ward wanted to move to 175 anyway and fight Kovalev, and those talks were already in progress, but for some bizarre reason, they felt like they had to send an offer, then say we turned it down, use that for PR, and then they said since since Triple G turned down the 168 offer, that's why he's moving to 175. So I didn't know how Triple G influenced his career that much. If he really wanted to stay at 168, he could have stayed at 168, but he decided to move to 175. He had already moved up. <laughs> his last Andre Ward's last fight at 168 was in 2013, two that years whole, prior. That's a whole different conversation. I mean, the one fight he had after that was that catch weight, I think at 172 or something with Paul Smith. Yeah. So he had already moved up. Now, can I ask you this? And, and if yeah. we can't give details, that's fine. But uh, Rock Nation, when they sent you this offer, was it a typed out formal contract or just an email yeah. feeling out kind oh, of message? It was a very simple email. Just a feeling out. It wasn't want, an official contract, nothing like that. No, it was just we want uh, we want to offer. It wasn't even an offer. We're like, what's the offer? It's just like we'd like Triple G to move to 168 and fight Andre Ward uh, in a 50-50 fight. 50-50 meaning financial basis. So, you know, whatever that and is. Ward it even have a title still? It would have been the same. I don't know if he even had the titles or not. He might have been stripped by then because he had been out of the ring for two years practically. So I don't know. But then people say, well, why wouldn't you move up to 168 to fight Andre, but you would have to fight Carl Froch, which would have been 90,000 people at Wembley Stadium. Huge event. Yeah, somebody just asked that right you, here. You uh, would have, we would have to fight uh, Chavez Jr., which at the time Chavez Jr. was still a hot commodity. 
and uh, top rank made the offer to Chavez Jr., which would have been a huge fight. Triple G versus Chavez Jr. at that time, when when the son of the legendary fighter who had a huge following at that time would have been would have been a great fight. Those were two big events because Triple G always said, "If I'm going to move up, it has to be a very meaningful and naturally a lucrative fight." And, and with Andre, it didn't really move the, the the needle. Like I said, the Lemieux fight was just as big as, if not bigger, because he brought in Canadian pay-per-view money than, than a fight with uh, with Andre would have been. And and I didn't, again, I didn't turn down the offer. I just said, you know, once he gets these fights, then, you know, we can consider it. But by that time, he was long gone at 175. And like you said, he hadn't fought at 168 for, for a long time. So the whole thing didn't make sense. It would have been like me saying, because remember there was also a little bit of rivalry between Triple G and Floyd, where Floyd was naturally you know, the, the most popular, most successful uh, boxer um, at that time, clearly the, the biggest financial uh, gain uh, earner of that time. So we give Floyd a lot of credit. But if I would have sent Floyd an offer or Leonard or where it was, uh, yeah, uh, we'll fight Floyd at, uh, you know, 154 on 50, 50, whatever. And then they turn it down. And then it would have been silly for, for me to go to the media or Triple G to go to the media and say, Floyd, turned down. Right. I mean, it, it, it just wouldn't have made any sense. The only time, Michael, and this is what a lot of people didn't uh, realize or didn't know. And, and uh, Chris Mannix had called me up afterwards and I kind of went in a little bit of detail about it, but HBO, when Triple G was first coming up, if you remember, he made his HBO debut 2012 against Proxa. Proxa yeah. We had fought so hard to get on HBO. I told Peter Nelson at the time and Kerry Davis was there at the time. I said, he doesn't need a lot of money. <laughs> he'll right. fight anyone at 160 he's a world champion uh just give him the opportunity and and we had fought and fought and that was in january and not until september only when daniel Gill pulled out of that one fight that he was supposed to fight against proxa not proxa i'm sorry um pirog pirog was the guy that yes. knocked out danny jacobs right. and he was a wbo champion and so it was supposed to be daniel Gill versus pirog Nobody wanted to fight Pirog because he was a huge puncher from Russia, knocked out Danny Jacobs. I think it was in the second round. Nobody wanted to fight that guy. Then Giel gets an offer to fight Felix Sturm for 600000 I remember the numbers. If we could have gotten anyone at that time to fight Triple G for 600000 we would have been doing backflips. <laughs> but but uh, and Triple G changed the whole economics of that middleweight division. So then Daniel Giel goes to Germany to fight Sturm because Sturm was boxed in a corner too. The WBA was two years. They kept giving me Sturm exceptions, exceptions, exceptions. And then we pressed him so hard on the legal side that they said, okay, the only way Sturm can get one more defense without having to fight Triple G was in a unification fight, which always trumps mandatory. So he had to fight a, a champion. So that's why he offered Giel so much money to come to Germany. He still lost. So he should have, he could have easily just fought Triple G and lost to Triple G, but he fought Giel and lost to a Giel. But that's what opened up the Pirog fight. So then it was Triple G and Pirog, and Pirog in a unification hurt. fight for all those doubters that said, why didn't uh, Triple G fight this guy or that guy? That he was going to fight Dimitri Pirog, who nobody wanted to fight in a unification fight at WBO. Then Pirog hurts his back, mm -hmm. never fights again. So it was a legitimate injury. So now it's Triple G. And then I remember Artie Palulu was the one that had that date because of Daniel Giel originally. And he was involved with Pirog. So then Artie finds the complete opposite style for Pirog. It's a right-handed big puncher to to uh, Proxa, who's a mover, boxer, European champion, southpaw, and and uh, HBO said, will you fight uh, Proxa? I said, it doesn't matter. He'll, he'll fight whoever it was. Then naturally, the dollars went down. They were trying to do everything to discourage, Artie was, to discourage uh, Triple G from, from taking that slot. And I have to give HBO credit. They protected him because they realized, look, nobody wants to fight this guy. We're just going to put him on and so it was Triple G and Proxa. And uh, this was after Proxa stopped uh, Sebastian Sylvester to win the European Championship. He might not have been that well known over here, but at the time he was very well respected in Europe. And then Triple G just dismantled this guy. He had the first time on HBO dismantled, I remember. dismantled a world-class European champion Southpaw boxer and just like broke him down, broke him down, broke him down, I think like in four rounds. And it was such a huge reaction from the fans. They're like, wow. We need to see Triple G again. And then it was Rosado, that famous fight with Rosado, where Rosado was so bloody, and this trainer said uh, to his father, I got to stop the fight, otherwise your son's going to die in the ring. 
And uh, people criti even criticized that one because we couldn't get any, I'm telling you, Mike, we couldn't get any of the 160-pound fighters, the top-level fighters to fight. So so uh, Rosado was the number one guy mandatory at 154. And people said, well, we brought him up as because he, he's a smaller guy. If there would have been a 160-pounder, top 10 160-pounder, willing to fight him at the time for a reasonable amount of money, because remember at that time, it was the economics that HBO was paying Triple G was very low. So we had to make it work from that side as well. And uh, mm -hmm. then he had that fight with Rosado. And then after that, he was just on his way. Oh, getting back to. Oh. Your, your audio just went out, Tom. Am I back? Oh, yeah, you're back now. You're back. Okay, sorry. Okay. The only time it could have worked was, was after that uh, Rosado fight in 2013. Uh, Andre was coming off a shoulder injury. And if you remember, he fought Edwin Rodriguez. And yeah. I told Peter Nelson at HBO, because I remember it was out there that the that everyone was getting paid a million dollars. And I said to Peter, I said, Triple G will fight him for a million dollars. That's a much bigger fight. Triple G lives in LA, trains in Big Bear. If that fight was going to be in Ontario or was in Ontario, he would have sold a lot of tickets. And um, and the, the answer I got from HBO was that they didn't want Andre to fight Triple G at that time, 2013, because he was coming off the soldier injury. So that's fine, but I didn't go out and say, <laughs> Andre doesn't want to fight Triple G, but that would have been really the only time that fight could have happened at 168 pounds. Because after that, after he went on and fought Matthew Macklin, he fought Martin Murray, you know, all those all, all those solid wins, his star just kept rising and rising and rising to the point where, and and you made a good point that, that Andre was really fighting at 175, that uh, it just their their paths didn't cross. Do I think it was a great fight? I think it would have been a tremendous fight. I can't predict would Triple G have won that fight, would Andre have won that fight. That's impossible to predict, especially back then, um, you know, when Triple G was uh, clearly coming up. But that that probably was the, the, the one time uh, in their careers where they could have fought. And I don't know why it was such a back and forth uh, just because Triple G became successful. I remember Danny Garcia, his father, remember uh, uh, Angel Garcia, he was really mm -hmm. bitter too. He was bitter about why don't the American fans support Danny and they're 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 buying tickets for for this guy from Kazakhstan and and they're not buying tickets to see Danny. But again, it was the same thing. It wasn't the most exciting, the exciting stuff. So I'm not singling out Andre Ward. And again, I'm not trying to diminish his career. I think as an Olympic gold medalist, which is virtually impossible to do these days, um, and and uh, all the other fights that he won, um, you know, you can't minimize it. I just don't know where that whole back and forth came from. Can I ask you something? Uh, we're actually American boxing fan here in the chat. He asks, um, why did you want Chavez Jr. and Frotch at 168? I think you've already answered that because, again, both of those guys bring in significant international money that Ward couldn't, so it would have been worth going up at the time. Uh, but he also includes, but why did you want a catch weight of 164 pounds for Ward? Was that ever a thing? Because that still brought up. That was never a thing. That was Why does a, that get brought a up? private conversation. I was I, I was down in uh, well, where was it in Panama for a WBA purse bid uh, for the Vladimir Klitschko uh, on uh, Alexander Povetkin fight. Okay. If you remember that? That was a yeah. record of twenty seven million dollars. Uh, which Povetkin now is getting a lot of heat because he actually put something on social media where he's supporting Putin and the effort and the war and everything. And that, I don't yeah. know, I, if you're an athlete, I would stay far away from that because, you know, one thing I got to give all the, you know, boxing is so fractured, but all four of the sanctioning bodies, WBC, WBA, IBF, WBO, all the presidents came together and said, we're not going to sanction any fights in Russia and we're not going to re recognize any Russian uh fighters in terms of uh fighting for world championships and you know that might hurt the russian fighters but that's the only way you're going to put pressure on putin i heard that the russian team now isn't allowed to uh, compete in the uh in, in the um the paralympics um mm -hmm. so you know you just, the world just has to put pressure and, and it might be unfair to the russian people but that's the only way you're going to get to putin is that you know with between these sanctions and all that type of thing but anyway to get back to your question with dan Raphael, we were just chatting and he wanted to know how it was here at the uh you know getting ready for the purse bid and the whole thing and then he said something he mentioned something about war and i said yeah the only way that fight would would uh would happen you know might be you know that, that they have to meet at a catchway or anything like that but there was no absolutely no negotiations 
in, in fact, if you remember, Andre brought down what, whatever the name of that uh, Dawson, Chad Dawson, Chad from Dawson. 175 to 168. So, you know, at that time, Triple G was the bigger name. So arguably we could say, okay, you want to fight for Triple G's titles at, at 160? We'll, we'll fight for it. And Andre actually had a famous quote where he said he would have fought Floyd at 160. So if you're going to fight Floyd at 160. Yeah. But anyway, I don't know. I don't want to go around in circles, but that was never a thing. But that, you know, that was a conversation between you and Dan Raphael. That's what I was talking about Nothing earlier. Nothing to do with Andre's. We weren't even in a, in a discussion with Andre's people. I remember, you know. But that got uh, reported as news. <laughs> I think Dan Raphael talked he about wrote, it. He wrote something about, you know, Tom Loeffler said uh, they would fight Andre Ward at 164, and then all of a sudden that blew up. And it's like, that I, I didn't I didn't understand that at all. That wasn't, uh, that wasn't, uh, he had asked something, can I quote you? And it was so late over there with the time difference, I didn't respond, but I didn't say yes. And then for whatever reason, I don't understand why that became, he put that out there and naturally, Everyone jumped on that from the ward side. See, I told you he wouldn't fight him at 168. This wasn't even realistic, you know. But anyway, I, I don't want to dwell on that stuff. But that explains why that whole thing with 164, which I, I don't think would have been a bad idea because Ward was a great fighter at 168. Triple G, the great fighter at 160. You know, many of those top fighters will meet in the middle if there's ever negotiations. But, you know, it ne never even came to that. There were never any negotiations. The only time... Could have happened either it was in 2013 or after Triple G unified all those middleweight championships, and then if Ford was still the biggest name at 168, okay, maybe uh, it might have happened after that point. We got a question here. Well, first, uh, a super chat pledge from Remy. He says, "Salute Michael and Mr. Loeffler. Thank you, Remy. Appreciate that." And a super chat from Sam A. Thank you, Sam. He asked uh, Tom, "Why was Canelo so much better in the second fight with Triple G?" I know the body shots, but was Triple G 100%? Uh, I would say Triple G was 100%. There was no excuses going into that fight. There were some fights where he was sick. Uh, definitely the Gabriel Rosado fight. He had he had the pneumonia uh, on the Thursday before the fight. He could barely breathe. Um, so there were a couple fights where he wasn't 100%. Uh, can't make any excuse for the second Canelo fight. I think it was just a style. I think uh, Abel at the time really wanted Canelo to come forward. So he was the one kind of grinding the whole thing about, you know, Triple G was very outspoken about the positive tests. You know, a lot mm -hmm. of people forget <laughs> Canelo actually did fail two positive, uh, two, uh, two tests at the time. But, uh, and that's why the whole thing with uh, Vonis, remember the whole thing? Again, oh, Vonis, God. Yeah. Yeah. Of the course. Four pounder and we brought him up. And I mean, that was literally a last minute opponent replacement on two weeks' notice. And uh, he was going to fight Mugia at the MGM on HBO pay-per-view. And then somehow the Nevada Commission, a guy that was 28-0 with 25 knockouts, they figured wasn't uh, it was too dangerous. That's what it was, too dangerous for Triple G to get in the ring with him uh, against Jaime Mugia, who's turned out to be, you know, who turned out to be the best 154-pounder and has gone on to... Uh, to uh, a great career. He just fought uh, recently in uh, in Tijuana, so I thought that would have been a great fight. Everyone was on, was on board, MGM, HBO pay-per-view. Everyone thought that was a great idea because it was still Cinco de Mayo in Las Vegas mm -hmm. against an undefeated Mexican fighter who physically was bigger than, um, than Triple G, but they didn't approve it. So then we had to come to Los Angeles. By that time, it was too late for the window with HBO pay-per-view, and so the economics totally changed. And so then we went with, uh, with Bonus, um, who, again, you know, he was there. He was local. He was in Glendale. He had fans. He had Armenian fans. And uh, and that's how we made that fight. Uh, but I kind of lost track on, uh, oh, why did he fight differently in the second Canelo fight? Um, I, I would say it wasn't as clear. Like I said, I, I thought he won the second Canelo fight. If you look at it, like if you break it down round by round. But uh, Canelo came forward because I think Abel was really egging him on and uh, thought that would be to a Triple G's advantage. But I think it uh, hurt on the decision with the judges because when Canelo was coming forward, I think the judges kind of leaned towards it was a very close round. They gave it, unlike the first fight where Triple G was going forward, pressing Canelo I was just back. Say, yeah. he, didn't get, yeah. he didn't get credit for that. But then the second fight where Canelo was coming forward, and I, I give Canelo a lot of credit. Um, uh, I give Canelo a lot of credit. He made adjustments. Uh, he fought much better uh, in the second fight. I think he learned a lot in the first fight. People also have to understand, you know, Triple G was eight years older than Canelo. So when the WBC, when Canelo beat Cotto and the WBC ordered the mandatory, 
with uh, uh, Triple G to fight uh, Canelo because he had waited so many times. He was supposed to fight Sergio Martinez. Then Cotto. Then Cotto Sergio... paid him money. Step aside, right? <laughs> he was supposed to fight Sergio as mandatory. Then Sergio fought Cotto. Right. Then Cotto fought Canelo. And each time it was getting more and more. And then finally it was like, okay, we all signed it. I signed it. Mauricio signed it. Mauricio Suleiman, president of WC. Eric Gomez uh, of Golden Boy. We all signed the thing about the paper that the winner would get. Uh, no, that was, I'm sorry. That was after Canelo beat Cotto. Then he wanted one more fight. But then he guaranteed, the Golden Boy guaranteed, okay, let's get one more fight, and then and then we'll fight him for sure. And so that was what we signed. That's when, if you remember, that's when he fought, I believe it was uh, uh, Amir Khan. It was oh, Amir yeah. Khan. So we gave that fight, that 155, that's right. Yeah, we yep. gave that fight to him. No problem. No step-aside fee. It's like, okay, we just want to get the Canelo fight. Let's go. And then Canelo still holds the record <laughs> as the only – champion from mexico only wbc champion from mexico to ever vacate a wbc title so you know hmm. you can take that for what it's worth at that time i think uh, triple g would have done even better uh than the first uh, that was i think it was 2016 maybe even 2015 but probably 2016 yeah then uh so the, the then the fight happened in 2017 which you can imagine if canelo vacated the title not to fight him then when he wasn't obligated to fight him you can imagine the negotiations that we had to go through and the concessions that we had to go through to get Canelo in the ring the first time because I was pretty much convinced Triple G was going to win that fight. So I didn't mind making the concession because then I knew it would be a, uh, it'd be a second fight. Goes on uh, for some bizarre reason. Uh, Adelaide Bird had 10 rounds of two for uh, Canelo <laughs> when HBO, who was neutral, was scoring at eight rounds to four. <laughs> that was for, for Triple G. Pretty clear fight so, for Triple G. What I like is how the, the narratives change now on social media and there's a lot of Triple G detractors and say, oh man, I knew, you know, I, I always thought Canelo won that fight. 90% of people thought Golovkin won that fight, but. And, and 90% of the ringside media who's not, right. who's not biased, you know, it's just right. like, there was a poll and I think it was 38 out of 40 ringside uh, media thought uh, Triple G won that, won that first yeah. fight. Naturally, yeah, that doesn't change the decision and, and we got to live with it, but there was something something not right up there in Vegas. You could not, if it was a close round, Triple G couldn't get around for the life of him, whether it was the first fight or the second fight. So it was disappointing uh, to get a draw the first fight and to lose. It, it seems like a fight by one. Each each fight was one point. If one judge would have scored right. one round differently, it would have been a draw in the second fight and Triple G Win. victory in the first, first fight. With Don Trella, <laughs> we can't let Don off the hook. Oh, yeah. With the seventh round? One, seventh? Adelaide Bird only scored two rounds for Triple G. So you got to figure those must have been landslide rounds. And one of those rounds, the seventh round, Don yeah. scored for Canelo. If he would have scored it for Triple G, which everyone else, I think, thought Triple G won that seventh round, then he would have he would have gotten the decision in the first in the first round. Yeah, we can't let down off the hook on that one. Um, it, it it seems to me and to a lot of fans that those that the draw and the loss to Canelo uh, kind of changed Triple G. He seems like a changed guy. He he's not doing the media rounds like he used to. He's not speaking English in a lot of interviews. Do you, do you get the sense that he's kind of he just looks at it like I'm going to do things my way now, and that and that's it. I don't care. I'm not doing. I'm not making concessions. I'm not doing favors. It's it's just my way or the highway. Well, he was very disappointed. I'll tell you, with both decisions, he was very disappointed. Mm -hmm. uh, he made big paydays. Uh, you know, we we negotiated uh, where he got the two highest paydays of, of his career uh, with the Canelo fight, and not to say Canelo got. Ah. I think uh All right. am I back? Yeah, we got you. Yeah, you uh, dropped the yeah, game. Canelo got huge paydays uh right. also. So anyway, I mean that was those were huge events. Triple G had a huge fan base, Canelo had a huge fan base. Uh and when you look at Canelo, which I agree, I would say Canelo is the best pound for pound fighter right now. But when you look at Canelo, uh Triple G maybe winning the first fight, draw the second fight, then you gotta say <laughs> Triple G has to be right there. It was that close. Mm -hmm. Uh, of those fights, but you know what can you do? He's focused on Murata. I don't want to. I don't want to uh, backtrack on Canelo either. You know, Canelo has had a great career, tremendous career, arguably the most marketable fighter in the world right now. 
uh, fighting uh, uh, Bebo, which I think is a great fight. Mm -hmm. um, great if uh, if uh, Triple G can go to Japan and, and beat Murata and unify the titles, then you know if there is a third fight, then uh, I think that's uh, still going to be one of the biggest fights, if not the biggest fight, uh, in the sport of boxing this year. So let's talk real quick about the Murata fight, and um, that's over in Japan. Yeah. I, I think a lot of American fight fans don't understand the the numbers involved with that. Cause I mean, Murata has done 10 million plus viewers just in Japan for some of his fights. He's a star Huge. over there. Huge star, uh, yeah. How are ticket sales? Have, has ticket sales opened up yet? And how, if, if at all are, but my COVID restrictions come into play? Cause I think they're still doing the mask thing over there in Japan and stuff. Like, so how is all that working? There's still a lot of restrictions in Japan. There's still some quarantine issues uh, coming over there. Hopefully uh, as we see it here in the U S as we see in Europe, Things are relaxing by the time it gets to April, which is uh, you know about a month away. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, it'll ease up in uh, Japan also. Um, I don't have the exact details from Mr. Honda in terms of the ticket sales, but uh, wherever Triple G goes, he's he's a rock star. Just like I said, he went to the O2 Arena the first time he fought in uh, in London against um, Kel Brook, and the O2 was sold out. And so I'm sure that whatever the capacity is, Murata's a rock star over there, Triple G is a huge international global star. Uh, that's gonna be a, a, a huge, uh, huge event. And, and that's no easy task. There's a lot of, there's a reason why yeah. a lot of fighters don't like to leave their home country. Some fighters don't even leave their home state to fight uh, somewhere else. And uh, to go to London, you know, with the time difference, with the, with the, uh, uh, the food is different, you're in a hotel, uh, the training is different. The whole environment is different. And then to get ready for the fight, um, you know, it takes a big toll from you. And then to go to Japan, I can imagine that's going to be a challenging situation as well. So you got to give the fighters, especially when you think about it, it's not like Triple G's coming from the United States. Mm -hmm. He lives here now, but he's originally from Kazakhstan. So if you imagine him going to Kazakhstan, that would be like the, the, the Super Bowl for Kazakhstan over there. So he's selling out arenas here, but I'm pretty sure the arena will be sold out in uh, in Japan, and you got to give them a lot of credit for that. And this is, I think, his third fight in that the zone contract, right? Because it was a six fight deal. Is it his third or fourth? I can't remember. I think, uh, I think it's his fourth fight. This is his fourth. fourth okay, yeah, so I have two more. Twice, fought twice in Madison Square Garden. Then, remember, during COVID, he fought at the Hard Rock in Miami. Okay. Uh, and then uh, this will be the fourth fight. So the Canelo fight, if that happens, if he's successful against Murata, that will be the fifth. Then there's one more. Um, do you think um, win, lose, or draw with Canelo, he'll definitely fight one more time um, as a part of that deal. Do, do you think he'll fight on past that, or do you get the sense that that'll be it? It's hard to say at this point. It really up to Gennady. I mean, he's one of the most fit fighters I've ever seen. Uh, I haven't been to this training camp, but all the reports I get from Jonathan Banks is that he's in tremendous shape. Uh, he, he takes care of his body. He doesn't hang out late at night. He doesn't drink alcohol. He doesn't do anything that's bad for an athlete. So at 40, he'll be 40 in April. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he's the type of guy, especially with his punching power and his chin, uh, where you can keep going, you know, further and further and further. Um, you know, if he gets the Murata, I mean, if he wins against Murata, if the Canelo fight happens or another big fight in the fall, then, uh, uh, you know, it would be up, really up to him. But I, I noticed uh, now with uh, three children that he has, you know, he's definitely spending more time around the family at home and that type of thing. Okay. Whereas before, when he was on that tear and fighting four times a year, five times a year, um, uh, when he was alone in Big Bear, it was just like focused boxing 100% every day, you know, and now it's naturally school and homework and things like that. So, you know, it, it's really, it's, it's hard for me to predict because it, it, it'll be uh, his decision. And, uh, you know, he hasn't talked about retirement. So, you know, okay. when athletes start talking about retirement, then it's like, they're okay, you're pretty much retired. Yeah. Being in that direction. Yeah. Real quick, uh, because I've kept you for over an hour, so I'll let you I'll let you off the hook here in a minute. But I wanted to ask about your, your club series in, in Hollywood. When are you yeah. bringing that back? Yeah. Uh, I was at the first one where there was Chivas flowing. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, remember I don't remember Chivas much about that. <laughs> I, yeah. remember. I just remember yeah. I actually interviewed you and you were pretty lit, Tom. You, you were pretty <laughs> lit. Actually, more than me. 
Yeah. But the scale tipped, <laughs> and then I got I got a little worse. But anyway, uh, those are always fun events, and I, I definitely want to get back out there for one of those. But uh, yeah, what's up? What's up with those shows? So uh, we're gonna make a big announcement next week. Um, okay. We've already announced the show. It's uh, St. Patrick's Day show, uh, Mar uh, Thursday, March seventeenth. Uh, we sign uh, Callum Callum Walsh to a promotional contract. He's a uh, six-time Irish national champion, uh, European champion. He's with Freddie Roach, who you know very well. And uh, I've never seen – Freddie has so many world champions. I've never seen him really excited about a young fighter like this. And uh, every time I talk to Freddie, he's always saying, yeah, Callum looks really good in the gym. He's sparring. He's, uh, you know, sparring with world-class fighters, holding his own. And southpaw, tall southpaw, big puncher, which I like to work with the big punchers because just like the Triple G line – you know, the more excitement you can bring in the ring, I think the more response you'll get from the fans. It's the first time I've ever seen Michael. He made the pro debut on our December show. First time I've ever seen uh, fans from Ireland. Fans from Ireland flew out for his pro debut to be in Montebello, California, the Montebello Country Club at the Quiet Cayman. <laughs> they were standing on their chairs, as Irish fans do, and singing. Yep. And uh, it was a tremendous atmosphere. So we're definitely going to feature him on the St. Patrick's Day show. Uh, we're going to announce next week what type of uh, uh, broadcast platform it's going to be on and uh, okay. we have uh, some high hopes for him. So that's Hollywood Fight Nights, Thursday, March 17th. For the local people in L.A. and for the Irish fans in, in Ireland, uh, Montebello Country Club, the Quiet Cannon. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful location, overlooks the golf course there. Uh, right in the heart of Montebello, which has a lot of uh, great boxing fans from Montebello. It's like Steve Kim's stomping Steve grounds. Exactly. Here, uh, it's Steve Kim's stomping ground. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Sergio Mora lives out that way. So okay. um, yeah, Sinisa Estrada came to uh, came to the show in uh, in September. So uh, we're excited about that uh, St. Patrick's Day show. Awesome, awesome. I will definitely get out there for one of those. Um, you know, Chivas or no Chivas, I'll, I'll be there. It was a lot of fun, man. I, it, this was a, a great interview, Tom. Thank you for taking time. I, I know Good that you've man. got a lot on your mind and you got to yeah. uh, get down to San Diego and get to that fight tomorrow. I hope you enjoy it and uh, we'll keep in touch. We'll talk soon, my friend. Definitely, Michael. It's great. Always great talking to you. Keep up the great work and I uh, uh, hope to talk to you soon. All right. Have a good one. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, you too. Ciao. There he goes, everybody. All right. So I uh, hope you guys enjoyed that interview. Um, covered a lot of subjects. And, and Tom always uh, keeps it real. Um, gives me his – his. Uh, he, he There's just no spin with him. He's just going to give you how he feels. And that's one of, one of the reasons why I think Tom is uh, so successful in the business. And uh, He's been able to work with a lot of different folks. And he doesn't burn bridges. One thing is when you talk to certain uh, people, it, every promoter – has kind of burned a bridge here or there. Not Tom. He's just one of those uh, great guys. All right, so uh, we're going to wrap it up. My wife is literally right there saying, let's go. It's Friday. We, we, let's go get dinner. All right, guys. Uh, have a great weekend. Enjoy the fights. And uh, I'll see you guys Monday over at TNC. All right? Peace. Peace.